What are story threads? A dedicated thread where right fags can come and create stories, thus saving other, innocent, TG threads from being burdened with things like creativity and imagination. No right fag threads could technically be described as story threads, but this page is for threads whose sole purpose is to provide a platform for right fags, rather than threads which are dedicated to TG topics like Warhammer, MTG, ETC, and happen to produce right faggotry in the process. What goes on in story threads? Sometimes the OP will set a topic, which can be just about anything, thus inviting others to both read his right faggotry, and contribute their own. However, the most common incarnation of story threads on TG are the more freestyle poster picture, writer story threads. Why are story threads important, and what do they have to do with TG? If you ever want to be an even half decent DMGM, you need to be able to write good stories, and create good settings to put them in. Hell, if you even want to play traditional games it generally helps to have some understanding of how to create decent characters and narratives, even where story threads do not appear to involve direct TG related material. It's all good creative exercise for when your players derail you so thoroughly that you have to create an entirely new campaign in the space of one bathroom break. Post a picture, write a story. The name is self-explanatory. People post pics, and then write fags come along a write about what they think is going on in the pic. Some Anons suspect that this is part of a secret NSA PSYOPs program to administer a variant of the Rorschach ink blot test to large segments of the online community. There are two flaws with this theory. One the vast majority of Anons are too lazy to write anything, and two I create a lot of those threads and if I'm working for the NSA, I am being grossly underpaid. The Bolt Pistol. Ah. Save me, the greatest indignity of all. Falcarian things. These demons have come to pick the field. Clean off spoils. Don't leave me here like this. Don't forsake. Any. Don't condemn me to such an ignoble. End. Lord. Where are you? I can't see you anymore. Did I not serve you well? That's so sad. Please tell me the bolt pistol gets a loving owner and has many heretic purging adventures, please. Hey. What are they we are? The wiry little guardsman halted at the glint of what looked suspiciously like gold. After a brief peek around to make sure no one was paying him any attention, he sidled away from the rest of his squad and dug at debris hiding the shiny object. To his surprise it wasn't a gold tooth or an abandoned chrono, it far bigger. With a final grunt he yanked the object free and boggled at his find. Oh my my my, what's a fine lady like you doing in a place like this? The guardsman's eyes glowed with delight as he hefted the oversized bolt pistol and checked it over. The dirt and grime fell away instantly and, surprisingly, the action still worked as smoothly as if it was fresh from the factory. A stupid grin plastered the trooper's face when he pulled out the magazine and found it still half full and free of any corrosion. Thinking quickly he held the gun up in one hand, and quietly whispered to the surrounding wasteland. Anybody lose this? It belong to anyone? Well if no one's gonna say nothing, then I guess it's my duty to take this air fancy gun as legia men bally field salvage in the name of the regimen and the emperor. Satisfied that he'd done all he could to find the weapon's original owner, the guardsman hastily crammed it into one of his oversized coat's men pockets, then ran to catch up with his squad. The poker game that night was awkward at first, a man who had no name and no rank aside from so was sharing their trench. To the squad's relief though, he didn't try to stop their game, and even joined in after a while. The relief turned to dismay as the man quickly began taking pot after pot, leaving some of the more reckless betters without a single throne left. The smallest, we see Lee's guardsman was getting ready to give up in disgust when, to his amazement, he drew a four of a kind. Unfortunately the final round of bets went too high and no one would accept and I owe you from him after he'd refused to pay the last seven. In a mix of greed and desperation, he brought out his recently scavenged prize to cover his shortfall. The entire squad gasped as it dropped onto the table with an impressive thud. The nameless man stared at the bolt pistol for a second, then met the guardsman's eyes for a disconcertingly long moment. He met the bet and called for a show of cards. The guardsman triumphantly laid down his four cards and sprang towards the pot while cackling, only to find his lunge stopped by the stranger's gloved hand. It was holding a straight flush. The burst of laughter and curses from the soldiers in the trench was interrupted as the nameless man carefully picked up the bolt pistol and inspected it. His eyes lingered on the cross hanging from its grip, and then, in an incredibly swift motion, the gun disappeared into the inside of his coat and the man stood up. His gaze traveled across the trench, leaving each guardsman feeling like their very soul had been taken out and examined for flaws. 
Finally it came to rest on the pot and the man's previous winnings. I'm done for the night gentlemen. I think I'll leave all this in the pot though, as an apology for leaving so early. Do keep this to yourselves though, I wouldn't want everyone to think I was going soft you understand. As Inquisitor Nassau of the Audace Hereticus left the room he paused at the doorway and watched the guardsmen as they squabbled over the small heap of cash. He touched the artifact bolt pistol through his coat and smiled. The Emperor's tarot had been right about it being worth a trip up to the front to inspect the troops. Dominant life form. What is this form? I was supposed to be inserted into a member of the dominant species on this world. This cannot be right. I have appendages with suitable graspers, but they are undersized compared to my core mass. They assured me these creatures were bipedal. Why are the lower limbs undersized as well and what is this structure supporting me instead? It appears to be an electromechanical device designed to fit my form. Were the reports wrong? Have they already started embracing technical symbiosis? This is worrying. I must look deeper. What is this? This body has immense energy reserves, but no way of using them that I can detect. And how did these organs develop? They appear to be alternately straining and overcapable. There is no balance. Either it has stockpiled internal resources to the point of damaging itself, resources that it cannot even process in an emergency, or I must be missing something. Yes that's it. Something new. Something we haven't seen before. Something we can use. Hidden somewhere in this apparently incapable and illogical form must be the secret to this species dominance. I will find it. It will be ours. Now how to find this secret? I do not have the resources to perform a vivisection and in-depth scan, but this form's unconscious mental functions are still intact. Yes, I will follow its instincts and observe. Wait, what is happening? I detect a strong desire to intake. Can it actually hold more? Is the secret some sort of catalyzing agent? Ah this one here, this is the one it craves. Let us use these graspers to acquire it. Damn it. How do they use these things? I need to get closer. Almost, almost, no. Wait. Shit 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 shit. I'm disabled. The body must be resisting me. And now one of them appears to be recording me. They must know I'm here. Abort abort abort. End of dominant life form. Scout report 32874214483. Pathfinder agent Zrathgalax. Lich and dinosaurs. Arise this was the greatest and most vital step in the schemings of the ancient pharaoh Kimuntak the Eternal. His resurrection had only been the first step to attaining an eternal reign, but to realize his lifelong dreams of world conquest, he would need so much more. He needed an Amy. To this end, he began researching the ancient beasts who lived here. During life, he had mastered the art of breaking the savage lizards to his will. During his reign he raised entire armies of these beasts, with winged peras striking from the skies with the speed of eagles and a cavalry of mounted Carnoxii, the largest and most ferocious of their packs, serving as his bodyguard. The largest of these Kamuks, the Tyrant, served as his personal mount it seemed, however, that in the ages since Kimuntak's untimely death, these beasts had fallen into ruin. Countless wars of succession devastated the once fertile landscape into a blasted desert, and when the land died so did its beasts. If he could be resurrected, the eternal pharaoh surmised that so too could his steeds nigh, arise. He whispered forbidden words, curses, cantrips, and spells, filling the bodies of what once walked with the energy of the living storm clouds swirled thunder crackled towards him. And yet he still chanted soon the wind itself started tooming black, not unlike smoke. The pharaoh's chanting grew louder as the wind blew harder, as if he could overpower the gods, where a mortal man would have probably given up and forsaken his work to avoid this divine wrath. The unliving pharaoh kept shouting with regal intensity. He had defied death none could stop him now. All of a sudden a single white bolt shot at him. The earth was detent as it collided with the ground and yet he lived. The storm subsided, and at once, the winds had died down. The only noise that remained was the hymns of Kimuntak the Etimal. Arise. He felt it. That same lighting that struck him an instant ago now flickered within him. It flowed through his desiccated fingertips. With a cautionary motion, he pointed it to a chamber on the left of the altar where he stood. The white lightning flooded from him and within seconds, it aced its way through the chamber. Arise. It worked. He finally did it. A herd of skeletal raptors, each no bigger than he emerged from the chamber. Next, he pointed to his right. Again, lightning flowed, and more raptors rose. Soon, the entire city was repopulated by the undying beasts of yore, arisen by their king Kimuntak worked tirelessly, and ever since that day, the skies never did once darken again. 
he understood that he had now become a god. Arise. Last to be reborn was his tyrant, his mummified steed. It roared as it returned to wakefulness, but it understood who it was that revived him. The beast bowed its head, and Kimuntak rode upon it. His armies had at last returned as he remembered it. Terrors once more took to the skies, and Kamixi prowled for their next prey. Heavily armored Kylax whipped their mace-like tails as they ponderously marched forth alongside the long-necked Brontus. Kimuntak felt it once more, the lightning sought release once again. He raised his hands in an upward gesture, and an entire dazzling array of bolts flooded forth and they bounced between the tips of the ancient pyramids arise. As if they were vomited by the earth itself, the pyramids ejected themselves from the sands. Their jerkish uprising was then replaced with an unnatural stillness as they did not fall down again. These pyramids, they remained air bone, now powered by the very power of the gods Kimuntak surveyed all this, the undead legions of the beasts and the bastions now above the earth. He surveyed all this, and he thought it good with a motion forth with his staff, the legions began marching forth. The raptors flooded out from underneath their graters, and the pyramids ominously droned on thus did the reign of Kimuntak the Eternal begin again. The Deep Sleep. Niels had been serving drinks at the Deep Sleep for over 15 years. Despite the economy going to shit, nature conspiring against the establishment if that recent rainfall was anything to go by, and the tax collectors at his door, Neil always pulled through. Though every year, on a simple Friday in the middle of May, he closed the bar for the entire night. The city didn't know nor care to know why he did this, but it disgruntled them all the same. Making sure the sign on the front door read closed for the night, Neil sat down at the bar with two beers and a packet of cigarettes and simply waited. As the sun slowly crept down and down until the brilliant hues of sunset could be seen through the windows of the bar, Neil felt the comfortable coldness he had come to associate with these visits. Hey, long time no see, a raspy voice said behind him, sounding like fingers dragging across dry bones. Turning around, he saw the familiar sight of the Grim Reaper, yet he seemed more dreary than normal. Grab a seat, you look like shit. The reaper lazily grabbed the bar stool and pulled himself to it, leaning heavily over the bar. So what's up giving a heavy sigh, the skeleton in a dress started, lighting a cigarette all the while. Another suicide today, wasn't even a lonely man who had lost his spouse or family and nothing to lose. It was a young boy, no older than 12. 12 Neil, just a small child and so much to live for, the reaper's voice seeming to break, if even a little bit. Raptor Squadron. Raptor 6 to all units. Icepick Company has just confirmed civvies in the strike zone. We're still going in, but stick to smart munitions and watch your fire. A hurricane of curt acknowledgements filled the comms for a moment. James could tell they wanted to complain about underkill, but no one wanted to be guilty of blue on blue either. We're on final approach. Stick to terrain following, there's heavy AAA covering the enemy advance on this side. Raptor 1, you are to prioritize AAA, the rest of you are to prioritize ground vehicles. Icepick can handle the infantry. Raptor 6, out. The leading squadron of 8 squat wildcat fighter bombers seemed to sink even lower into the skyscrapers at that. Just trying to bypass laser based AAA was bad enough. Engaging it directly amounted to justing a tank with a bomb on a stick, and LT Charl Webb, Raptor 1 CO and lead wildcat. Felt his titanium nanotub skin hull to chill a little more even though he knew he wasn't in a biomorph body and shouldn't be feeling any actual emotion. Brain uploading had been a mature technology long before the earth evacuation, but no way had been found to cut out emotion without fraying and fragmenting the mind. And residues of flight or fight responses kicked around in the back of his mind as he acknowledged an almost suicidal order. But Charles was a veteran Raptor 1 was nothing but fighter bomber veterans, and they all knew the score. Containing the enemy within New New Yorkshire took top priority, and the northbound superhighway, Icepick Company's side of the encirclement, was the enemy's main line of advance. Either they stopped them here or the enemy would run roughshod through the encirclement's rear, and that could not be allowed to happen. And Icepick was in a bad way, now, and sufficient artillery or artillery wasn't going to arrive in time. Raptor Air Company was the only fire support available, and they needed that AAA cleared out. Webb chewed on the problem for a good few seconds, and a few hundred meters of ruined city, before he had his answer. At his terse and hud assisted orders the eight wildcats spread out in a line abreast and dropped down as they cleared the skyline, hovering in place just over the water of the channel. 
three of them released their Reckon drones as they did, and nine tiny delta wings unfurled and streaked just over the battered and cratered skyscrapers on the other side. Raptor 1 seemed to quiver in place over the agitated water as they waited, the drones highlighting enemy vehicles and passing the data to the rest of the formation. Then one drone vanished in a small firecracker fireball. Then another, but the third drone fingered their killer seconds before another AA laser smote it from the sky. Other drones swooped around in dizzying evasive maneuvers, crossing and crisscrossing and ducking behind buildings. It didn't save them, but by the time the last drone had fallen from the sky without a right wing every detectable enemy vehicle had been ID by type and last known position, including the AAA. Wed looked over his tack map, satisfied he fingered the guns, and then gave his orders the 8 wildcat surged up and forward over the channel. Splitting up into two aircraft wings and streaking just over the rooftops towards the last known positions of the AAA vehicles. As they did, they lose three missiles each, which fanned out and sped ahead of them on tongues of orange flame. Charles and his wingman frantically scanned the streets and debris streaking just ahead and under them. If they missed with the missiles, they were only going to have one shot with the nose cannon and that's if they were lucky and spotted the AAA first. This was going to be dicey, but they didn't spot any active AAA on their dash from one end of the island to the other. They did spot and confirm the wreckage, and the back of Charles' mind seemed to lean back and exhale as he spun the wildcat around on its VTOL thrusters and raced back to the channel behind another wing. They'd made it halfway back when a frantic message came in over the squadron comms. Raptor 1, this is Raptor 1 Gamma. We've been locked up by long range AAA the message was composed, sent, received, and running through Charles's mind within a second of the first scanning radar pulse being detected, and an icicle seemed to form in the back of his mind as he glanced out his rear sensor bundles. Raptor 1 Gamma and her wingmate, Echo, was way in the rear over the other channel and burning straight back on full afterburner. They had just passed back over the island when two streaks of propellant rose straight out of the landscape beyond and tilted over after them. Shit, Gamma, Echo, drop down below the skyline and try to lose them. The rest of you, turn around and hold in place once you get to the other side of the channel, maybe we can interdict those missiles. Now move it. Acknowledgements flooded the comms for a brief moment, then silence as everyone focused on pouring on the speed. Gamma and Echo dived down the first street they could and wove frantically between the buildings. The missiles seemed to waver back and forth, snaking over the buildings as they chased after the two wildcats, closing slowly and steadily. And Charles wondered why they were so slow for AAA missiles as streets gave way to water below him. The six wildcats fanned in close behind him, spreading out in a line abreast and holding in place as they reached the opposite shore, and Charles hooked up to the battalion comms. I speak, where the hell is your triple A? It's all dead, mate. First thing to go, a faint Scottish burr seemed to color I speak's tone. Why? Charles began to compose a scathing reply. Then Gamma and Echo sped out from the skyline into open water just as the first missile caught up with them. The white fireball of an Acer warhead blotted out the light of the local star for a few seconds, seeming to balloon outward as it cooled to red. And static swamped the comms as the half-molten wreckage of Gamma's wildcat was spat out like a grapeseed from Hell's mouth. Charles saw Gamma's ejection datapod leap out on twin jets of flame. Then the second missile lanced through the rapidly cooling remnants of the fireball as the shockwave roiled over and through Raptor 1. The six wildcats recovered quickly and opened fire with their nose cannons on the missile without prompting. Oh, Icepick's self-reproaching tone carried through the remnants of the static even as his remaining units opened fire from the bridge. The missile sped for Raptor 1, twitching back and forth as KK cannon fire sorted through the storm of ECM it was suddenly throwing up. Charles pulled his aircraft up and back, trying to back into the city, and the rest of his squadron followed his lead as the missile closed in and vanished, not in a pure white sunburst but in the blue and white fireball of igniting metastable helium propellant as an infrared laser lanced it in its midsection. The nose laser turret of the thunderbolt interceptor responsible vented some excess coolant in a white spray as the lithe, almost knife-like aircraft settled in a hover above Raptor 1, followed by the rest of its 6 aircraft squadron. Raptor 1, this is Raptor 6, we just confirmed your assessment of the scan data from your strike, excellent job. Get back to the new Pacific airport and rearm. We need you back out here ASAP. Raptor 2, there's probably more launchers nearby, so you're on interdiction duty. The rest of you, continue as planned. Let's wipe these bastards off our city. 
The ice in the back of Charles' mind melted as he realized he wasn't going to die this sortie. Raptor 1 here. Need to recover one pilot first, and he slid back over the water on his VTOL thrusters, towards and under the datapod, drifting down on its parachute. Understood. Grab it and go. We should have spare wildcats at New Pacific, more wildcats, and a quartet of heavy set orca bombers. Thundered overhead as Charles extended a manipulator arm and grabbed Gamma's datapod by the chute lines. You okay there? Raptor 1 Gamma he sent over the data lines tucked into the lines. A pause. Long by an inform off standards. Then all good. If you don't count the bird. Satisfied. He spun around and sped off after his squadron just over the rooftops. As the island broiled with explosions behind him. Which was when he remembered something. Gamma and Echo had been added to his squadron as replacements after his last sortie. And he hadn't had time to ask their names. Raptor 1 Gamma. Can I ask your name a little late for it now, isn't it she seemed to pause between sentences again, and Charles emoted a wince as he remembered that ejection datapods had excellent memory, but relatively poor processing power, the price of having to fit an entire person's memories into a hardened shell the size of a baseline's torso. It's Jane McCoy, so I take it your family was into pre-evacuation serial videos, then Charles replied as he earmarked some unbowed CPU for Gamma's Jane McCoy's use. And Jean emoted her gratitude for the extra processing power. So who was Echo then another pause? Charles was absolutely sure it wasn't a processing bottleneck this time. He was Salvador McCoy. My husband. Oh. That was why. They flew the rest of the way, over the battered and war-torn city. And between them there was silence and ghosts. Inspect talk gadget. Gadget eyed the squig warily. His bionic eye wearing as it focused in and out. Get stuck in gadget magnifying glass. After a moment, a magnifying glass shot out of Gadget's wrist. He caught it with practiced ease. It had taken nearly 200 of those before he managed to catch one. As he examined the squig, though, he nearly dropped the magnifying glass in surprise. Gorkin Mork. Oh I. Tooth. Jetcher over air. Woes. Inspector Gadget. Boz the Gra jumped out of the Gadget truck and loped over to where Gadget was. Rig, take notes, Yajit. Ahahem, the claw holding the squig in place belched a cloud of smoke from such prolonged not killing. Subject appears to be a squig. But Tooth jumped as Gadget's voice suddenly rose. This ain't no proper squig. It's one edem, what you call, a decoy. Fake squig. Looky dear, Tooth. Get stuck in Gadget point and fang another claw that Gadget didn't know he had slid out from his back, pointing to exactly the spot Gadget was examining. Tooth's green face turned as pale as a green face could. But, but boss, he's supposed a, I know that, Yajit, growled Gadget. But dear it is just the same, emblazoned on the false squig was the sign of a double-headed eagle with a power claw rearing up behind it, the symbol of Gadget's oldest enemy, the claw, Commissar Yerik. So what do you guys make of it? I know it's a bit different than what we normally do, like, you know, the short stories thrown together. Um, but I really like them, like, you know, I'm sure if you spend any time on TG, you know the Emperor threads, like, you know, you see them all the time, like, you know, there's always one go on, I always see. Um, but no, I really like them, and, like, you know, it is a great way for people to, like, you know, improve on their own writing style, or, you know, just get, like, self-improvement is the aim of the game, I would say, and it is really important, and I, like, you know, even if they are, like, you know, a lot of the time, like, you know, they're a bit, like, creepy pastas, there's a good few that are proper shit, but, like, you know, it's always good to, like, you know, keep going, even if they are shit sometimes, like, you know, you have to do the shit sometimes, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you're not, you're not going to get perfect overnight, and this is a brilliant way to be able to do it, I would say, anyway. But, uh, hey, let us know your favourite bit for me. I love the, the Nobby cameo in this. I just, whenever I read it, I was like, is that, that's Nobby? Is that, is that Nobby? That's fucking is Nobby. I'm sure, I'm sure you'll see in the comments below. But I really, I really enjoyed that. Uh, bless, bless her poorly, Nobby's black heart. <laughs> uh, but uh, as always, well, no, actually, no. You know what one I actually really enjoyed as well? That there, the deep sleep. Now, I didn't really like the story too much of the deep sleep. I'm more just like the concept of it because it's really different. You know what I mean? The whole idea, like, you know, with the grim leaper in the bar. Like, you know, it, it's a strange concept. And just from the image alone, I, I would never have thought of something like that. I thought that was quite good. Even if I didn't really enjoy the story all that much, I still like the concept. Like, I really like the concept in that one. 
but no let us know for you guys like you know what do you make of it and um, next time i will be doing more of a theme i uh, probably will just be doing 40k ones because let's face it this might as well just be a 40k channel but hey i might do like a high fantasy or just like a funny one like you know inspector gadget you know what i mean that sort of thing so like let us know what you think down below and uh don't forget to like and subscribe and i'll see you in the next video if you haven't already check out my red bubble portfolio you might just find something you like this this is, is not okay this needs to stop now this is cancer this this is so much cancer that i can feel the tumors growing on my back and it's way down heavy on me and it's not okay can you help a nigga out and just stop this? Please?